Welcome back to the Purple Squirrel Podcast. We just spoke with Ted Guggenheim, the co-founder and CEO of Texas. He shared some of the most defining moments in the evolution of Texas, as well as how they broke into the staffing industry. We hope you enjoy it. You're listening to the Purple Squirrel Podcast, where you'll learn how to make the unattainable attainable through the insights of staffing technology experts. We're your hosts, Sarah Haberman and Hannah DeBool. Ted, we're very excited to have you joining us today on the Purple Squirrel Podcast. It's our very first episode, actually, so this is a this is really exciting. Yeah, <laughs> the inaugural podcast. Excellent. How did you guys get the name? So... A purple squirrel is in staffing and recruiting is an unattainable candidate, sort of oh. the the candidate that you will never submit or it's like lock your unicorn, down. right? Or yeah. place. It's like a yeah. unicorn, exactly. Yeah. yeah, or place, exactly. They're just the perfect combination of everything. So we want to help listeners of the podcast to make the unattainable, all things unattainable, unattainable with staffing, attainable. Through the Perfect. insights of our guests, like you. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, so could you tell us a little bit about um, TechStus and how you ended up founding and starting TechStus and then, I guess, just breaking into staffing tech in general? Yeah, sure. So um, my uh, co-founders and I started TechStus back in 2013. And um, Andrew Kimmel, who's one of my co-founders, and I had run a, a, an app development shop uh, for about five years previous to that called Rage Digital. We started it in 2008 when, you know, the app store really opened up and we quickly became experts in developing uh, uh, Apple or iOS applications um, for companies. And, and we focus on apps that would solve problems for, for large corporations. So over the course of the five years that we ran Rage Digital, we um, did apps for companies like Mazda and Pepsi and IBM, Red Robin, um, amongst many others. And um, it was really, you know, a, a great time to, to be able to learn how to use software development and also very, you know, fast-paced software development, which uh, mobile apps tend to be relative to, um, to web-based software, um, mm -hmm. because uh, you could iterate very quickly and um, you could build things that could solve problems um, for those customers. So we kind of became experts at, at problem solving, uh, uh, problems that we saw uh, these businesses uh, were, were coming to us with, and, and it was a very creative and, and fast-paced venture. Um, but being a consulting consulting company, which is you know what you are when you're developing applications, um, you know it, you tend to be uh, only as good as your last customer. And I knew from my experience in the music business, which I had done for 15 years previous to going into software, that. A recurring revenue model, uh, in, the, in the case of music, where you have record royalties and mechanicals and and, and, and so forth, um, uh, it, it was a, a better way to, to make money because you're making mm -hmm. money while you sleep when, when you're in that sort of recurring revenue type of, of, of situation. Yeah. So we decided to migrate from becoming a um, a consulting company, an app dev shop, in, into a product company. We just didn't know what the product was going to be until we until we built it. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that we looked at when we were trying to consider uh, solve, trying to solve a business problem and maybe and trying to start with something that we had already imagined or created was a, uh, a web-based application that was the very first version of Textus. Uh, we were actually called Textus.biz originally, originally because Textus.com was taken. And um, we had built an app. And now you have it. <laughs> and now we have it. Um, exactly. And so we, um, we built this application um, to allow you to communicate from your web browser uh, with one of our apps, uh, sort of like a concierge type service. And uh, it, it was cool, but the people who were supposed to use it never really downloaded the app to, to, to use the, 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 the communication or concierge piece of it. So we kind of felt like this great idea had gone uh, you know, un, un, untested and unutilized. And when we thought about what the problem was with, with you know, the adoption, of, of, of the com, of the concept between um, a computer to a device uh, uh, conversation was that the person had to download the app to have it. And so after years of telling people, you have to have an app, you have to have an app, now we were saying, well, the app download is, is sort of the hurdle. So how can we bypass mm -hmm. that hurdle and make it much more efficient for the person, the business to communicate from their 
web browser, their, their web application that we built to people's devices um, more efficiently. And we recognized that everybody already had a texting application on their phone. And uh, why shouldn't we just send those messages back and forth between the web browser and the, the person's handset and, and their, their device? Right. Yeah. So we um, that was around around the time that Twilio came out, and Twilio allowed us to um, get a, get a very quick, uh, a fast go to market um, product up and running, or at least at least a proof of concept um, that we could send messages from your computer software to uh, a person's device in real time. Is and Twilio, excuse me, is Twilio just sort of like a, Twilio is like a connector, right? Twilio is is a, it's, it's an API-based messaging platform um, and, and also a voice platform. So what they did was they made it very easy for companies or for developers to, um, to be able to send messages from an application, a, a web application, through their system, through their API to the carriers, um, whether it was a vo voice call or whether it, whether it, it was SMS. And, and so we saw that it could work, but we didn't love the idea that you had to have a separate phone number from, from, from Twilio, a 10 digit phone number, to allow the, the, the messaging part to work. That seemed like a, um, like a disconnect so, you know, for, for the business to say, here's our phone number and here's our text number. So we hmm. went about, uh, about the, the process of trying to figure out how the SMS you know, the whole ecosystem works in terms of other technology that be behind it. And we eventually figured out how to be able to text enable uh, the company's existing 10 digit phone number um, because we thought it was much cooler to say to the business, um, hey, now, and now it's the same phone number you've been putting into your advertising or on your website or on the door of your business or in your email and say, call or text me, it's the same number, even though it's not a cell phone. Yeah, that's huge. Mm -hmm. That is, yeah. And so that was really the, the premise was like, oh, wow, we can text enable landlines. Um, and we thought that was going to be the key driver. But we really believed, you know, for the first two years that our, our solution that we had developed was going was to be for small businesses. It was going to be for, um, you know, uh, salons and spas and gyms and car dealerships to be able to communicate uh, via SMS with their customers. And we spent a lot of time trying to, you know, convince small businesses to, to, to use this 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 product um, because you know we, we we believe it solved a real problem for them and for those you know uh, dozens or a few hundred customers that uh, that signed up initially they loved it they thought it was a, a great product but for the price point of what we were selling it whether it was forty nine dollars or ninety nine dollars a month um, the acquisition cost to bring on a small business customer didn't scale was and that like so, a per user? Was that a per user cost, per, or was per, it just per phone per... number? So every time got we, it, we, we, we say, you know, we'll text enable your number, and it costs this amount per, per month, and now you can message from your from your uh, from your computer. What was the reasoning that you had for targeting small businesses? Was it just a matter of you hadn't dreamed so big yet? Yeah, it was a little bit of a, a lack of um, a lack of uh, imagination because uh -huh. <laughs> we, you know the concept that we, we talked about and had you know had uh, sp spoken to you know, in our research with, with, with the users and, and businesses was like, why do I have to call my salon to make a haircut appointment? Why can't I just text them and say, you know, mm -hmm. is uh, you know, Cindy available at Thursday at 3.30? Um, instead of calling them, going to voicemail, them picking it up, calling me back, going to my voicemail, et cetera. And so it does, it still does solve a real problem for, for small businesses, but um, for the amount of demand that was out there at the time uh, from the small business market um, and, and the acquisition cost to bring on uh, a new business, it just didn't, it wasn't a viable uh, model. So and you didn't so, even envision at all that this would be used in the staffing industry when no, you set out? No, wow. we, we had no idea. And that's kind of the, the funny part of the story. When you talk about software startups and, and, and companies and, and their journey, um, you know, we're kind of a, of a, of a classic uh, story in the sense that, you know, we developed, we pivoted, we developed, we, you know, we adjusted. And mm -hmm. um, you're, you're trying to find your product market fit. You're, you know, when you develop software, you're trying to figure out, you know, where is the addressable market and how well does your, does your product solve that problem? And we knew small businesses from, from our experience with them that we could solve the problem that their communication was not efficient. Mm -hmm. But 
again, the acquisition cost, you know, you know, didn't scale. And so what ended up happening right about the time we were running out of money uh, for the, like the third time, <laughs> <laughs> this is back in uh, 2014, uh, we had a bunch of, uh, of independent, of inside salespeople from mind body online. If you guys go to in the gym, yeah. you probably have seen mind body. They, um, they That's started signing up to text to us. Yeah, right. It's, it's a gym software. You yeah. just, you know, everyone uses it. It's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a huge company. Um, but at the time, they had about 200 inside salespeople who were trying to, to reach the customers who had signed up to their lead forms and their website and, um, and uh, in marketing to, uh, to, to try to get those, those, those businesses to, to do a demo. And because they're small business owners, you know, much like candidates, uh, yeah. they're very hard to reach. They're on the go. They don't pick up phone calls. And so they knew from experience that if they would text those leads from their phone, they would get a response. But they knew that it didn't scale to try and text hundreds of leads from your phone. You have to get the contact information into the phone. You got to know who, who the person was. You have to, right. you know, it, it, just, it just doesn't make sense on a larger scale. So um, I went back to the to Mind Body Corporate and I said, look, this is obviously working for, for your people and they're paying out of pocket to, you know, to use text us because they, 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 they were putting their credit cards into our, our then small business system, you know, do-it-yourself do kind of pay-it-yourself model. And um, I said, let's that's, do a deal. That's faith, Seth. That's very pure faith. <laughs> yeah, right? I yeah. mean, if you're, willing, yeah. if you're a salesperson, you're willing to put your own money down to, to uh -huh. get a product, you know that's, that's a proof of concept there. Yep, yeah, right. Willingness to Absolutely. pay, they say. <laughs> so that's what that's uh that's when I got my first enterprise deal, and um, we, we ended up signing uh, up 200 inside salespeople, and it doubled our re revenue, which was very small at the time, uh, <laughs> overnight. And that was the aha moment where I'm like, okay, we are an inside sales sales acceleration tool or a sales enablement tool. And mm -hmm. I asked them, you know, how can we make this better? And they said, well, we, 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 we have Salesforce. So if you could build a Salesforce app so that we can, you know, track all of these, act all of these activities in our CRM, that would be great. So we built our Salesforce app and became a, mm -hmm. an ISV partner with Salesforce. And I thought, okay, that's what we're going to do. We're going to go after inside sales teams, uh, mostly Salesforce users. And that's what Texas will become. Wow. But there so was a little hitch along the way. Oh. Uh, a good hitch, <laughs> and this gets to your question, uh, which is the first sales guy that I hired, full-time salesperson, was Eric Huguenin, who is now our, our chief revenue officer. Mm -hmm. and I know that name. Everybody at, 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 at Bullhorn knows, knows Eric. He's mm -hmm. phenomenal. Yeah. He's uh, one, of, one of the biggest uh, Bullhorn uh, advocates and, and, uh, and best connectors out there um, for both of us. So... I hired him just because I believed he would be a good salesperson. I liked his, his energy. He liked his style. He's a classy guy, mm -hmm. um, you know, former athlete and just a real, seemed very driven, mid Midwestern. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, Eric, you know, we just signed up our first enterprise customer. They were using Salesforce. Let's go find more mind bodies. Let's go, um, you know, become a, a, a Salesforce, you know, app uh, for inside sales teams. And he's like, that's great. But... I came from staffing, Eric said, and Perfect. I know mm -hmm. that the recruiters have the same problem that the inside salespeople do because recruiters are just totally. inside salespeople, but they're selling mm -hmm. jobs right. instead of software. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, if you say so, I've never heard of staffing, <laughs> not <know> anybody <laughs> in the industry, but uh, go see what you can do. So he went out and he started to demo Texas this back in 2015, early. And he would show people, text us, and what it could do for their um, their response rates. And um, uh, he would go to staff agency after staff agency and go from demo to pilot to close to demo to pilot to close. And that was when we decided to, you know, put uh, pretty much a full force effort into becoming the best uh, staffing sales enablement tool available. And um, and that's where we where we entered the industry. What were some of the major roadblocks when you were first breaking into staffing, though? Like, were there, it was 2015, not everyone had texting yet or was quite comfortable mm. with it at, from, mm -hmm. a, from a sales enablement perspective. So what yeah. were some of the common mis misconceptions or concerns at that point? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that, you know, one of the concerns 
Well, well, there's two parts of that. One, one of the concerns was that people thought that texting a candidate would be disruptive, that people would, would, would think that they're getting into their, their personal, you know, SMS world and, and that they would feel, you know, uh, like they were being, you know, um, intruded upon. Mm -hmm. And um, what they had, didn't realize and what we learned, came to find out was it was quite the opposite. It was the way that recruiters, or sorry, candidates preferred to be communicated with because they found that the phone calls and the emails to be uh, intrusive and annoying. And that's mm -hmm. why the, the recruiters had so much success with texting, um, you know, out of the box, you know, in, in those pilots was because... Um, people loved it. They, they would respond right back. They were getting 30 and 40% response rates up from, you know, That's five awesome. or 8% of an email or a phone call. Do yep. you find any of that to be generational? I know that's like the, the it, cliche thing to say about millennials, but is, do you find that to be true? Um, that's cliche. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I'm 56 and, um, you know, I don't even call my wife. I text her. Um, and, uh -huh. and, and my kids are in high school. In college, and uh, if I want to communicate with them, uh, I, I have to text them. Right. So, so while, yeah, it was much more generational in the sense that uh, young people got it right away. Younger people, uh, the people who are my age or, or, or older, uh, knew from the same type of experiences in, in terms, of, terms of trying to connect with their kids or even their grandkids mm -hmm. that texting was the preferred method of communication. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, most of the time. Yep. And it cuts right through the noise of, I mean, first it was a full voicemail inbox and a million cold calls a day. And now, then it was emails and and whatnot. And now you just you just cut straight to their phone. You um, do. And, and, and I think and, you build rapport faster, too. I think just like even meeting new coworkers, you you kind of build rapport more quickly over like a G chat or a, or a texting interaction than you might in other ways. Mm hmm. No, that, that's that, that's true, yeah. and, and I think that um, that what we teach, you know, what we preach at Text Us is about you know keeping it real. It's about how do you take um, so to your, your question earlier, you know, what were some of the hurdles when we we would go to ASA or Executive Forum, you know, the first year, uh, people uh, would look ask us what we did, we explain it, and they go, oh, so it's it's a it's, you know, it's a promotional product. We, we can we can advertise or spam people. And we're like, no, 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 this is conversational. This is about how do you engage candidates? How do you build relationships? How do you communicate on, on your candidates' terms, not your terms? Because they're, they're, at the end of the day, they're, they're, they're the boss, right? They're the ones that are, yeah. that are taking, taking that position. And so the first conference, the first year, was since 2015, we went, went to ASA, for instance, or, or SIA. The, 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 uh, the questions were like, so what do you do? How does this work? And we would explain to them that, well, we text enable your existing number. We, um, you know, eventually we, we, the next year we came back, we could integrate with Bullhorn uh, or, or your, whatever ATS you're using. Um, uh, but it's a way for you to get response rates that you just can't get from emails and phone calls anymore. And they'd go, huh, that sounds kind of interesting. Um, well, you know, give us, a, give, us a, give us a call or, you know, we'll, we'll see you down the road. And in the second year, we went, 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 to, went to, uh, to conferences in 2016, people would come to the booth and we had tremendous traffic. It was, it was, it was just so much fun. It was one of the best times to, to, to see, you know, how fast the company was growing and, and how something was being adopted. And the second year, mm -hmm. they would come to the booth and they'd say, okay, we've heard about texting. We think we need this. Um, how do you get started? You know, is it complicated? How long does it take? What's the cost? So they got past that barrier of, you know, what is it? to um, how do we make this work? And then the third year, uh, it was, we love you guys. We told our friends about you. You, you gotta call these, these guys. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it was like, you That's know, awesome. we were the, uh, the, the hot kid on the block. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was really, you know, going from just one year of being completely uh, unheard of, second year of being people familiar and comfortable with it, and third year of being, you know, how do we, how do we, uh, you know, jump on board and, and, and get, or get, or get more, more, more use out of it. It's a pretty We're, quick evolution. Yeah, it's, it is. Can you tell us a little bit about starting out in the Bullhorn Developer Program and then moving on to becoming a Marketplace Partner? Yeah. So um, we kind of cheated uh, that one. Um, <laughs> At we, least you're we, honest. Well, so, did a lot of, so, so did a lot of the very first developer partners. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, we work. We, yeah, well, that's, we learned it from someone else, right? <laughs> um, and so we kind of figured out how to integrate um, as a, an outside partner. They, they kind of had the, the idea of the outside partner and the inside partner. And uh, so we were, were an outside partner for you know quite some time, and we were d d um, we were you know building our our relationship and our customer base and 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 working on providing this this, this great product and this great integration and um after a while you know because of you know eric really being uh, at, at so many uh, of the of the conferences and trade shows and building such a, a tremendous rapport with the the bullhorn sales team uh you know both the field team the enterprise team even you know um, probably some smb guys but um eric really sort of epitomized um, the way that Bullhorn likes to see vendors, you know, develop a relationship over the long run um, mm -hmm. by really making it making it mutual from the get go. Yeah. So um, we, we we were an outside partner for quite some time, and then um, eventually at one of the uh, trade shows, I believe, um, uh, you know, Bullhorn came to us and said, "Well, uh, I forget who was the the marketplace rep at the time. Um, I think it was it was Brittany. Uh, anyway, uh, mm -hmm. they." Um, yeah. They said, "Hey, how would you guys like to be an inside partner?" Uh, and we said, "Great. You know, what's it take?" They said, "Well, we have to make sure that your your product works and that you you know meet our criteria, and that you have to show that we have some shared customers." And they said, "How many customers do you guys have?" We said, "Well, we probably have about fifty or 60. And they're like, <laughs> "Oh, well, <laughs> you're in." Forget, forget the uh, <laughs> easy. For, yeah, forget the uh, the validation process. And mm -hmm. so we um, became you know a marketplace partner. I've had great success uh, working with your team. You know, our sales team and and your sales team share a Slack channel. They're always going back and forth, sharing deals. You know, we're we're giving your guys you know leads and ideas and feedback, vice versa. So it's really a a, a, a two way street beyond just a, a software integration or a partnership. It's really more of a of a, of a sales partnership and mm -hmm. um, and a, a revenue uh, partnership uh, as well. And I think that we're rather actually one of the of the uh, First, people to be part of, of, of the new uh, revenue share modeling that that the uh, that uh, Nina and those uh, folks have put in place. Absolutely, yeah, it, you are. It sounds like you guys have had a lot of success. Moving into the staffing industry has been incredible, and you guys have been a really great partner to us. But mm. I actually am going to wildly derail this because at the very <laughs> beginning of our conversation, you said something about working in the music industry, I and did. Hannah, Hannah, and I of course did our homework and took a look at your LinkedIn. And we saw that you were the assistant to the manager of Sting. Is this true? My boy. <laughs> you ready to get into this? <laughs> Absolutely. So um, tell us a little bit about that. It's a very yes. interesting place to start before staffing. Well, it was a lot more interesting. I don't know if it was um, no, uh, staffing's the best, best use of my, Sta um, my first 20 years out of college. Uh -huh. um, but it was a lot of fun, and and, and I started the, uh, in the in the industry when I was in college in Boulder back in uh, the early '80s, and um, as a promoter on campus, and we did a lot of big shows. We did stadium shows, and um, you know pretty much you know every band um, uh, you know from the early '80s that you can imagine came through Boulder at one point, mm -hmm. and that's where I got that was where I got a taste of the, of the industry. So when I left um, CU back in '87, uh, I went to New York and I. So I was working for uh, for the booking agency for Sting, and mm -hmm. uh, I, was, I was thinking I would become a booking agent. And I did that for a little while, but um, I didn't love it. Uh, it was a little bit more, um, you know, as a junior, a junior agent, you were trying to sell bands and, and place bands in, in new markets and smaller venues that were harder to book. And, and, and you had the, I didn't really have any leverage of have, having any, any larger artists to, to kind of, um, you know, swap out for, for to convince them to take, take a smaller band. So I was, I was about to leave the industry. And then, um, you know, I had been a huge police fan, uh, you know, when I was in uh, uh, you know, college and high school. Mm -hmm. And um, I always loved staying on, on, on a solo career as well. And one day his manager came into the office and I was literally getting ready to look for a new job. And I bumped into him and I said, hey, um, I heard that you're opening an office upstairs in the building. Do you need any help? And he said, well, what can you do? I said, well, I mean, this is back when like Macintosh had nine inch monitors, you know, and nobody, mm -hmm. nobody knew how to use them. They're floppy disks. Yep. And, but you know, you could do Excel. You could do things that you couldn't do before then. I said, I can do computers, phone systems. I can bike messenger, you know, whatever you, whatever you need. Mm -hmm. He said, how much? I said, 200 bucks a week. 
happy. And he said, you're hired. There you go. So there you go. So I went on. That's uh, awesome. Went on for four years working for, for Sting and, and Kim Turner, his manager, and traveled the world over two album cycles. Um, you know, ran his his uh, his video um, screen and, and, and camera and, and, and team that would do the video mm -hmm. for his tours. But it was just a great, you know, opportunity to see the world and, and work next to one of my favorite artists of all time who, you know, still is a, is, is a, is a, uh, a good enough guy to make time to, 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 to talk to me when um, he comes to town. That's really great. There's this remarkable sort of analog between um, developing a new artist or a band and, and, and a startup. So when I ended up tra transitioning Definitely. from from music into technology, um, it was uh, by the time I, I got in, in, the, in the position to start Rage Digital and, and co-found Rage Digital and then text us, um, it was actually very natural because mm -hmm. yep. like the music business, you've got, first of all, if you start with the artists, you take, if, 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 take four you know guys in a band who are in their late teens or early 20s and four guys who are in a startup who are engineers and do a photo shoot of each of them, take the logos off their shirts and you can't tell which one are the, are the engineers and which ones are the band members, uh -huh. right? One yeah, of them yeah. sat in his closet and played <laughs> guitar and you know, with no friends. The other guy sat in his room and played wrote code. <laughs> Um, but, um, but they're, you know, and that's why they call great engineers rock stars. You know, mm -hmm, there's yeah. a lot of similar similarity, but then, you know, the manager of the band, you know, is, is the CEO, um, mm -hmm. it's the exact same role, just a different title. Yep. Um, right. so the CEO, you know, the, the, the band members, the engineers, the, you know, the artists, the creative people, the, the imaginers, uh, the manager, the CEO, um, the VCs are the record labels, you know, they come mm -hmm. in with the money. They tend to do these onerous deals and, and throw 10 against the wall and hope that one sticks. And, um, and then, uh, you know, uh, you, you see where it goes. I'm um, also envisioning like the parallel between, and obviously hindsight is 2020, but the parallel between sort of your first job as an agent and trying to find venues for <laughs> musicians kind of matches up pretty, pretty well I, with recruiters trying to find people jobs. It, you it is. You could, could have used text us if there was. Yeah. Well, no, it, there weren't. There wasn't texting, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it's true. And, 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 you know, the other analogy is, is that, you know, what, what, what I learned in developing bands is that the fans, you know, even though the, the, the rock stars or the band members, are the one that could, could get all the, all the fame and all the, you know, in the money and in the, you know, favors, it's the fans that make it so. And so what I learned early right. on was that, you know, the, the band wasn't the boss. I wasn't the boss. The fans were bosses. Without the fans, mm -hmm. yeah. you're, you're nothing. And the same thing's true in, in staffing. The candidates are really the boss, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the staffing agency. It's not the ATS. It's not text us. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's the candidates. And if you don't treat the candidates like they're the boss, like they're the ones that are creating the opportunity for you to get them a job and get them placed, then you're missing the point. And that's how yeah. where texting comes into play, which is to try and keep that conversation, that engagement, Keeping it, keeping it real, keeping it non-promotional, keeping it fun, and, 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 and talking to them on their own terms like, like they're real people. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. I would have thought those were kind of incongruous things, the entertainment industry and staffing technology, but, but you're making a good not. case for it. Yeah, I've lived <laughs> so, it. So, yeah. Ted, we like, to, we, we like to close out every episode, or we're going to start closing out every episode with a little question that, goes along the lines of hire, befriend, or fire. So we're going to give you three names, and you have to tell us which one you would hire, which one you would befriend, and which one you would fire in a hypothetical company employee scenario. Okay. So your three are the police, Peter Gabriel, and Duran Duran. I would say... Uh... Hire the police, uh, befriend Peter Gabriel, and uh, fire Duran Duran. Although I do like Hungry Like the Wolf, I, I'll admit it. Who doesn't? <laughs> I like Notorious. <laughs> cool. Well, this Are has been great. Okay yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm comfortable with those choices. <laughs> totally comfortable with it. I too would befriend Peter uh, Gabriel. <laughs> And you guys, this has been you, fantastic, Ted. Thank you so much for joining us. You, you guys should go look at the um, at the Saturday Night Live skits where they do the two girls who were um, doing NPR. 
<laughs> because that's what you guys look like. <laughs> I forgot. You can see yeah. us. I don't have the uh, video up that's anymore. With, um, it's with Molly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, that's... It, they're so funny. I love funny. that. It's awesome. They're that, incredible. You well, can't help it. I mean, that, that's just kind of what it feels like. It's hard I'm, trying to talk into my mic, but I want to look at too. you every time... Yeah. Every that's, time you're talking. And that's what they're doing. Do that's thing. what they do. That's exactly it. Go watch the skit. <laughs> we will. We will. We will. Thank you for listening to the Purple Squirrel Podcast. If you enjoyed it, we hope that you subscribe on either Apple Podcasts or Spotify Podcasts. And if you're interested in learning more about Text Us and all that they do um, and can do for your staffing firm, you can check them out on the Bullhorn Marketplace page. Um, that is at bullhorn.com slash marketplace. And just go right in and search Texas. Yeah.